Howdy. I'm going to talk about the oil and gas mineral ownership and look at it from a map perspective. I'm here at the Texas Railroad Commission where I'm zoomed in uh, to a part of Texas up in the uh, Carthage, Panola County area. Uh, this is the uh, east area there uh, east of Dallas and then uh, southwest of Longview. I'm looking at a specific area here and then I, I've, I've actually gone in and I've typed in a, a API number. Uh, uh, American Petroleum Industry has a numbering system uh, helping to number every well where you might have the first numbers represent the state, the next numbers represent the county, and then the wells within that area. And looking at these individual wells, we see a very high density of amount of drilling in this area. Some vertical wells, which might be going down to different depths, to some uh, very horizontal wells. Alright, so in here I have to go in here and, and click on wells if I want to identify and look at wells. And I click on a well specifically. And I can look at the drilling permits, maybe even look at the well logs specifically. There's a lot of uh, different information I can drill into. I'm going to look at the drilling permits in here and look at this is the SOAP A gas allocation uh, well and talk about allocations and, and those elements of things and then go down and, and I will be able to pull a plat and look at this well uh, from the plat aspect. Now when we get uh, out there and we decide we're going to start looking for oil and gas um, we have these issues about the ownership and how land is divided into the surface owner uh, or the mineral owner. And it's really designated as so that you will either be the surface and the mineral or you might sever the surface and the mineral from each other. And if you sever the surface from the mineral, then the mineral owner, they say, has what's called dominant uh, ownership. And we talk a little bit about that in some of our readings. And that is so that you have the rights to get to your minerals, all right? But you have to go in and reimburse the uh, surface owner if you do any work in their area and actually if you have any uh, areas that you might disturb. So when you are looking at the minerals, you know, being severed from that standpoint from that and they've, they've sold off the minerals, usually what happens is somebody is coming in and leasing those rights and they have the leaseor and you're the leasee and gives them the rights to do some exploring. And then when they do that exploring, there's some term limits that, of how soon they need to explore and for, for what depth they might need to explore. So it might not be that I give you the lease, the rights to lease my minerals. That means you can go in and explore my minerals. And if you find some minerals and there's some payout from that, uh, the royalty owner, which is typically the one who is giving out the lease, is getting some money back from that. They might get one eighth or one sixty fourth. You know, uh, you know. They what happens to the other uh, seven eighths or sixty three sixty fourths? The mineral company who is doing the or the oil and gas company who's doing the work, they use that to try and pay for the cost for the for the oil and gas explorations. Now, um, these websites have a lot of information here. Uh, they, they have some ownership, maybe the original track, and you can see here in this purple line that we show, which is an original land grant. But you can see the surface looks a lot more divided than, than this big purple track here. So, actuality, you could have where this track is re recorded uh, or has been severed separately than another track or another track and another track. So there could be several tracks once the sovereign of the state gives away this original land grant and then the other owners start dividing it more and more and more. Each time they could keep the surface, keep the minerals or sever the surface and minerals. Now you could actually sell the minerals and, and then whoever owns them, they are the fee owner of the minerals and it might be the oil and gas exploration company that could have that. 
and you go around to the different states that's Texas here I'm gonna to go to Wyoming and we can look at a, a Wyoming here we're looking at the public land uh, again uh, sections in townships and ranges and this is a section right here and we go in we can see those and we can see the ones that are potentially owned by the Bureau of Land Management and then maybe those that are owned by the public and then we can see the wells and then that they might be drawn uh, drilled in multiple directions all from that one uh, surface location uh, a good zoom into that this pad this is the same pad that we're looking at right here we look at it in detail we actually can see a rig on location and you see they've taken quite a bit of land uh, to to work out here the rig sitting there we have another trucks and then we have some um, trailers where some support people working the two pits that uh, the drill material that's coming up as they drill it they're putting these over in this pits they have two pits here uh, probably because if we go back we can see a lot of different wells being drilled from that location so where do we decide to put those drill locations if you look at the two different ways that they look at the subsurface here they are trying to go after the section lands they kind of got in the middle of the section and they went in all directions here they went to the corner of these sections and they drilled in, in all all directions down here they're down at the bottom and they're drilling in different ways so are they fully draining all this oil and gas in this area or are they leaving some product behind you know there is a lot of analysis that goes on on to that in trying to understand you know what they're exploring so look at that in a little bit more detail I'm going to go through a presentation here of the oil and gas agreements uh, that the general land office has put together and understand uh, basically in a nutshell what are oil and gas agreements and why are there so many different oil and gas agreements to go after this oil and gas and this will help us understand the land aspect of things so the general topics is we'll talk about the agreements exploration unit agreements that's mean where I'm exploring to see if there's some oil and gas in there <clears throat> conventional this is typical uh, oil and gas where it's very simple to uh, basically drill down and drain a reservoir it's not uh, unconventional or tight gas they're in shell or or something where uh, where it's it's very difficult to do it enhanced recovery uh, uh, unit agreements uh, maybe you go back to a site and, and enhance something that's already been to get that little bit extra out of that and then talk about communization agreements uh, grouping uh, a lot of agreements together to try to to put things together so that you you would not just be draining one location you could drill from one location into multiple persons uh, mineral understeps and then where do you store those great agreements from that standpoint so why do we need agreements so well, to begin with we started with a little bit of history and we're going to talk about that and in, in the correlative rights and the benefits of unit agreements unit names and so forth and so on and then we're going to go into exploration of units forming of units uh, what happens when you drill and discover let's say you hit nothing no money is paying or it is paying on that and then who is participating and who gets how much and how much do they get so let's talk about the unit of capture well it goes back to the early days is that the concept of capture uh, started way back when they started to pull oil and gas in the Pennsylvania again uh, one of the first areas to pin oil to go after the oil and gas and it was whoever owned the uh, uh, groundwater or more importantly uh, like the wild animals they owned the oil and gas and so they kind of dictated in those early days before we severed minerals to go after the oil and gas okay so whatever oil and gas that you got at the time is yours okay so you basically skipping this position here you can see if this is the fee person they were going around and fee ownership means they own the minerals they're sh shooting around the corners and then the federal if they gave out a lease to somebody they were going around and shooting everywhere trying to slurp as much oil and gas not just inside their position but around others because if they could pull it from that next source so it was a race 
to pull all that. And so there was a lot of density around these lines, a lot of really thick wells put together. It depleted a lot of the reservoir pressure and uh, pulled it out. Now looking at that, let me explain that a little bit more. So imagine that this is like a slurpee, if you will, and you stuck your straw down into the slurpee and you just slurped around the edges of the slurpee. All right, so you don't have anything here. Now, one way to think about, well, how's the moisture coming out? You have artificial lift, you're slurping it up, or the earth is pushing down and pushing it up uh, from that standpoint. And if you have too many holes and there's not enough pushing down on the pressure, the oil won't come back up and you won't get the gas to flow. And so you have a problem and even artificial lift, you, you can slurp as much as you want on that slurpy and still nothing's coming. And you know, this is where they started injecting water into these to try to prime that, you know, to get the, the, the moisture in that area to increase. So they would do that from that standpoint. So it caused a lot of problems. So they went to this concept is that, when they're dealing with these reservoirs that you could have potential multiple owners that you could pull together and that you could capture it uh, with a correlative rights doctrine right and that correlated rights doctrine says it gives the opportunity to receive a fair and equitable share of the source of the supply not guaranteeing to receive the fair and equitable sh share so it said you know it, it doesn't matter where you were on that property, wherever you put that, that, that straw in, you got your share. So if you were way over here and you were slurping it and maybe the property was divided into multiple places, everybody got an equitable share uh, from that standpoint. And to do it, you need to also stay so far away so that you don't impinge on this one. Or if you did, then when you slurp, then they would get their share and they would get their share and then you would pull these uh, tracks together. So we need to have agreements on this so that everyone agrees that whatever comes out, it is shared. Because some might think, well, it's right on top of my property, so I should be getting the most. Where others would say, well, no, it's just really coming from my property too. It's hard for us to tell where it's coming from exactly. So these agreements were put into place to try to do this. And so we started forming units, and units were the maximum amount of land that we could pull together, put a lot of tracks together, and say we're going to deplete that unit. All right. So these unit agreement was one way to apply these correlative rights doctrine operation of multiple leases and single lease under a single operator okay so that's important so you got a lease and then you could pull it from that standpoint from that operator the benefits of the unit agreements is uh, there was an environmental uh, benefit uh, we weren't leaving a lot of oil and gas behind uh, and then it made it a little bit easier to actually lease out your land versus you could be the mineral owner so you could give somebody the opportunity to explore that area and if they could produce on it it worked very well all right so you have no units a lot of on top of each other we have a bunch of units you know you could have a very strong type depletion of that reservoir and again, obviously, the environmental benefits uh, is that you had less impact on the surface. Oil and gas reservoir benefits from the unionization. You can drill wells only where you need it. Uh, you, you didn't have to think of specifically uh, these lease lines. And if I go back here to the Railroad Commission and we look at one of the wells that we had here, so in this scenario, you might have even so where you form a unit over here and you form a unit over here. And so what you could have is a proration unit or you're allocating some drainage to this unit and some drainage to that unit. And in doing so, it tells the story of what's going on and, and you try to have to generate a plat that explains that. So up here, we can see a 640 unit that has all these owners in it and then down here we have another unit that is formed that uh, is also participating in 
the oil and gas. So we do some allocations where uh, some is going to be paid e as between this unit and some is going to be paid into this unit down there and this still might be unitized or all these are pulled together and these are all pulled together from that standpoint. Therefore, if somebody's drilling into uh, through these two units, we actually have to get an agreement between those two people to make sure that it's okay. And that becomes a big legal challenge. We go back and we look at, say, uh, the application to drill uh, this well uh, from that scenario. The Railroad Commission will allow you to drain these two do units, but they might have you go through a process of trying to explain who's the ownership and who is getting uh, data uh, from a lot of different uh, units and how is it being allocated and where is it and who's getting it from that standpoint and you might have a hearing uh, from that standpoint and you might have several forms and things that you have to turn in uh, as part of the legal aspect and a lot of it is done on spatial information that we know about that unit and the other unit. So these benefits from the unionization uh, really generates some documentation in terms of the leases that we have to generate and the fact that these keep coming up and telling us let me get rid of this message, sorry about this alright and so then the BLM you know they look at all this aspect of trying to keep up with all these units monitorization as owners of theirs in these federal lands. So we go back up to Wyoming where we have some federal lands inside here, right? And maybe some of these are publicly held from that standpoint. Uh, it could be that, well, maybe uh, fractions of units could be held by uh, the state and some could be held by private landowners. The BLM needs to maintain all these agreements as their due diligence looking after it from that standpoint. All right. Uh, there's just some information about the oil and gas. Then they go into talking about the names of these units. Uh, they'll call them certain names and they'll give them uh, different uh, names to keep an idea of what they're called and so uh, the, the BLM goes through and is the person responsible for that information. Alright well I just wanted to share more information on that. I have several good readings talking about mineral ownerships and presentations so please look for that and if you have any questions please give me a call. Thanks.